Thanos might be a universal threat and tough to beat, but without his fancy glove, he is not at the top of the food chain. With a name like Apocalypse, yeah, you're gonna be a problem. Apocalypse can't be permanently killed. He can die, he will come back though. He's the youngest on this list, I think. The baby, he's only about 5,000 years old. Apocalypse is an external mutant. That means the resurrection thing is part of his mutation. It's not a common mutation, he's special and different. He was recruited by the Celestials to join the line of Guardians. The Celestials took him away, added some Celestial tech to his body, making him even more powerful than when he started. To stay alive as long as he has, he must hibernate like a bear, then when he wakes up, he makes a mess and goes back to sleep. One time, he woke up and then almost immediately tried to start a war between humans and mutants and take over the world. Apocalypse can regenerate himself from a single drop of blood, he can alter his body in a variety of ways like make himself taller, he can fly, disintegrate you with a little tap of the finger, teleport, wield magic, absorb energy, plus more. He's someone you want on your side. Thankfully, in the end, he joins the X-Men by agreeing to live on Krakoa and follow the laws there. Picture the sun, like at its blazing peak. That's a lot of energy and power, right? Now multiply that by a thousand. Not to be your eighth grade math teacher with an odd math question, I swear, I'm going somewhere. That somewhere is Surtur. Surtur has all that power as established in Journey into Mystery 104. It also establishes that he can create a circle of pure flaming energy that is powerful enough to destroy an entire galaxy. That's just him, as himself, no absorbing other power or wielding anything. But he can wield, if you were wondering, specifically the Twilight Sword or the Sword of Doom. It was made using a galaxy that blew up and is now constantly on fire. It's called the Burning Galaxy because what else would you call it? In a bit of tragedy or irony or however you want to view it, the sword ended up being Surtur's demise in the end. So with all his power, Surtur can be killed, just only by an object of immense power greater than a thousand suns or when he's not tied to one. The Twilight Sword was almost kind of like a horcrux for Surtur. The first time he was beat, Thor had to destroy the sword before they could destroy the demon. And then the second time he was beat was using the sword. The sword was no longer tied to him, so it meant that his head could take a permanent vacation from his body. But just because the demon has been beat doesn't mean it was easy. He is less a physical energy and more just unstoppable force. Dormammu against Thanos is an interesting case. There is no denying that Dormammu is intensely powerful. His power comes from where he rules and lives, the Dark Dimension. When he's in there, it has been established that there is no fight that he can't win. He also has all the demons of the realm at his disposal, making a pretty terrifying army. But since he draws his power from his dimension, when he leaves it, he gets weaker. So in the event that Thanos were to fight him or face off somewhere that wasn't the Dark Dimension, Thanos does have a slightly better chance at winning, but probably only if he has the Infinity Gauntlet. Thanos, on his own, super powerful, stronger than the Hulk, can take a hit from Thor's hammer, and can handle wearing the Infinity Gauntlet. But despite all that, he can be killed. Dormammu can't, it's never been done. If you kill him, you kill his dimension, which is near impossible to do. Thanos, without his special mitten, wouldn't stand a chance. Ego the Living Planet has caused many a problem for many a Marvel hero and villain. The way to destroy Ego is to destroy his core, and that is hard to do. It did happen, but then he just like reformed himself later, so does that really count as death, or was it just like rest and rejuvenate period? To survive, this man planet started absorbing other planets, that is so heavy metal. He battled Galactus twice. The first time, he won with the assistance of Thor, but that doesn't mean he wasn't doing fine on his own. The second time Galactus showed up, Ego had gone insane, and Galactus didn't even want to touch that. Literally noped out of there, got help. Galactus goes to Thor, describes Ego as a menace that even he stands powerless against. The first time Ego was destroyed, the gravitational pull of the sun got hold of him. He tried to run, but crumbled instead. I looked it up, Earth's gravitational pull is about 9.8 meters per second squared, the sun's is 274 meters per second squared. But even though the sun was his ending, it was also his new beginning. The energy from it activated Ego's photosynthetic form of revitalization, and he got himself back together. He later fought a clone of himself, Alter Ego, and won. Good job. But it turns out Ego the Living Planet is only a small part of a big super ego. Super ego is a living bioverse. It's partially sentient. It's sentient enough to get a specific enough with who it's trying to attack. The stranger, a cosmic scientist with a knack for experimentation, showed up and created ego, alter ego, and super ego. Super ego looks like an ego universe, basically. He's got more bells and whistles, longer tentacles, more power, things like that. Super ego is also powerful enough to go up against an army of celestials. Like, there's at least a hundred that he goes up against. The Celestials are gods to the Eternals, the Celestials created the Eternals, and 
Thanos is an Eternal, just in case anyone forgot. Super Ego is presumably defeated, but it took a long time. Thanos has mentioned fearing Galactus before. In Thanos Annual 1, future Thanos shows past Thanos that they scrap with Galactus, and past Thanos says, am I out of my mind taking on that cosmic powerhouse? Later in the same issue, future Thanos shows what he considers to be like the top of the power pyramid. Galactus is in the bottom row, but that's out of every being Thanos has ever encountered and fought. He's on the same plane as Odin, Zeus, Stranger, Kronos, and a Celestial. That's a good lineup. Galactus is literally known as the Devourer of Worlds. He is a cosmic being, so he has the power cosmic. It's just unlimited cosmic energy, that's what it is. Battles between Galactus and other equal powers have literally shifted reality. He is considered by Nova Corps to be a universal threat, much like Thanos. I agree. His main weakness is his power has to be nourished, the nourishment in question. Planets, whole planets. If he doesn't eat planets, he will starve and die. But if he eats extra planets, he gets extra power. He has gone up against the Mad Celestials and beat one, but there were four, so he was outnumbered. Galactus is destined to be around forever and can move faster than the speed of light, despite the fact that he's like 18 tons and just under 29 feet tall. He has the power to throw devastating energy blasts, teleport, resurrect the dead, manipulate souls, mess with time, so the stones are probably not needed for him. Except for one thing, see Galactus, while he is a villain, he eats planets, he doesn't want to do that, he has to. So he did go out for the infinity gems in Thanos 4, but was going to use them to alter his own being to not be a planet eater anymore. It didn't work, but it's a thought that counts. So the Celestials, as established previously, they made the Eternals. The Celestials go from planet to planet, visiting the people there. They basically are trying to find a species worthy of having Eternals, that's their main mission. If a species is deemed unworthy or fails their Eternals, then goodbye, no one survives, which is why the Celestials are sometimes considered villains. The Celestials look as menacing as they are. There are so many of them, there are about 35 that we know of, but in the fight with Super Ego, there's an army there, like at least 100. The Celestials range in size. For reference, Thanos is about 6 feet 7 inches. One of the tallest known Celestials is about 20,000 feet tall. That's like putting a water bottle next to the CN Tower. Most are just a short 2,000 feet though. Celestials are never seen without their armor. The only time we've ever seen a Celestial without their helmet was in Eternals Volume 4, Issue 9. He takes off his helmet and his head is just a flaming ball of energy. The power of the Celestials is unlimited. The Asgardian gods can't fight against them, so Odin created this super armor infused with powers from everyone on Asgard except Thor. But when he sent a blast from it, a flick of a Celestial hand, and it was gone. Time and space mean nothing. They're immortal. Even if they are killed, it's not clear if they're gone or just go somewhere else. They don't need the Infinity Stones. Maybe power, if they had to pick, but most of the other stuff they can just do. In the rare event that the, every Celestial dies, even just one staying alive can revive the entire race. There aren't many things that can kill a Celestial, but the Beyonders can. They reside in the beyond. It's outside the multiverse. I can't comprehend that, so I'm just gonna accept it. They were the creations of the Celestials. A Beyonder kid created Secret Wars, that weird gladiator match from the 80s. A child did that. An adult is so much worse. The Beyonders launched a coordinated attack where they all attacked the Celestials at the same time and killed all but one. The reason the Beyonders were acting up was because they wanted to destroy the multiverse to get rid of someone else and then hoped when it restarted that guy would be gone. So if you tried to stop them blowing up the multiverse, they had no choice but to go after you. They also took out other entities like Lord Chaos, Master Order, Eternity, the Inbetweener, Infinity, and the Living Tribunal. That's a lot of powerful people. They have the power to build entire universes at their fingertips. Their only limit is they are confined to their own timeline. No time travel. Very sad. They can shift realities, just not like time travel in traditional sense, I guess. Like a lot of people on this list, they don't really need the Infinity Stones, but if they did want one, my guess is they would choose time. Logos is loco. They started out as three things. Master Order, Lord Chaos, and the Inbetweener. After the Beyonders destroyed the seventh form of the universe, the eighth form was created, and in this one, Galactus evolved into a force of creation. Master Order and Lord Chaos, they liked it better when he was a force of destruction, so they tried to get him to go back. But the Living Tribunal said, no, Galactus is perfect the way he is. Order and Chaos didn't like that, so they eliminated the Tribunal so they could be the top of multiversal law. They combined together right after that so they could really be top of the food chain. And now they are Loco Logos. Their name is actually just Logos, I just think they're really unhinged. They can also kill Celestials, and they did. It's just assumed that Logos has unlimited power. Master Order and Lord Chaos were regarded by a gauntlet-wielding Thanos.
Thanos to be more powerful than Galactus, someone Thanos already thought was immensely powerful. Thankfully, Logos was split back into his three pieces, he was too powerful otherwise. I just briefly mentioned the Living Tribunal, and he's the representative for someone called the One Above All. That's also a Celestial's name, but this ain't about him. The One Above All here we're talking about is literally the top of it all. He's all things lovely and good. His twin though? Uh-uh, Demon. His name is One Below All. So above represents love and creation, below represents hate and destruction. Below was created when above got really, really mad. It's like he literally split in half. The One Below All has one thought, destroy. Seriously, that is his only purpose. He wants to destroy everything. His power is limitless. He can and will destroy the entire multiverse on his own. His weakness is that he literally has no thoughts, head empty. So if he ever needs to make a concrete plan, he does need to get a host with a brain. Most of the time, he doesn't need a host. The one above all literally keeps below locked up somewhere away from the multiverse. Again, my brain can't comprehend that, so I'll just accept it. And only releases below when it's time to reset everything. So he comes out, destroys everything, then gets locked away again until it's time to do it again. What's pretty cool about the below is that he is the source of the mutagenic third gamma energy form, the form that creates hulks. Thanks for listening, y'all. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and make your mark on the comment section down below. Thanos is, of course, one of the greatest threats the universe has ever faced. So let me know if you agree or disagree with this list. This is Juliana, signing off. Bye!